The Monty Farm is a four acre facility um, on land that the University of Tennessee owns. It is back of the University of Tennessee Hospital. And it is a research area in which I have been looking at a very common question in every murder case. The question is how long has that individual been dead? And it is a four acre facility in which I have been trying to document and scientifically determine the length of time since death. What prompted you to, to make the body farm? Okay, let's go back just a little bit. I have to give you just a little history there. I taught for 11 years at the University of Kansas in Lawrence from 1960 to 71. Um, I identified skeletal material for law enforcement agencies there, particularly the Kansas Bureau investigation. And uh, in the late 60s, this would be 67, 68, they were having problems with cattle rustling in western Kansas. Now, if you watch the old movies, old western movies, the guy, bad guys comes in, they take the cows, they ride over the hills, and they're gone. But they don't do that these days. The bad guys these days bring in refrigerated trucks. They drive out on these large ranches, not only in Kansas, but Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, all that area. And they kill the cows in the field and butcher them right there. They hang the meat up in a refrigerated truck and drive off. The rancher comes along one, two, three weeks later and finds all these carcasses lying out there in the field. And the question is, how long have they been dead? Now, the police are interested in this because they need to know where in the sale of that meat they should begin to look. Um, and so the director of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation at, time, at that time was a man named Harold Nye. And Harold wrote me a, a letter asking me if I could look at cow carcasses and tell how long they've been dead. Well, I looked up in the literature and there really wasn't much in the literature. I won't say there was nothing, but there was almost nothing. And certainly dealing didn't do with cows anyway. So anyway, I wrote Harold a letter, wrote, wrote him a letter telling him that, Harold, we don't know the answer to that. But if you could get me, if you could find a, um, a rancher who would be willing to kill a cow and let me look at her every day, I could give him some data. Now, I signed my name at the end of the, at the end of the, um, uh, the letter, I, I wrote a PS. It's interesting what your mind is thinking about. But I said, Harold, we really need for the rancher to give me four cows. I need to kill one in the spring, summer, fall, and winter because your major factor in decay is temperature. Okay, nothing ever happened to that. It's like so many things, it just, it didn't get off the ground. Okay, I came here June the 1st, here being University of Tennessee in Knoxville, I came here June the 1st of 1971. I knew the medical examiner in Tennessee. I'd met him through the American Academy for Forensic Sciences. And I wrote, his name was Jerry Francisco. He was a forensic pathologist at the medical school over in Memphis. I wrote Dr. Francisco and I said, I have just accepted a job at the University of Tennessee. I'm gonna be joining uh, your state here uh, in a few months. And he wrote back immediately and he said, would you serve as the forensic anthropologist for the medical examiner's system? And I wrote back and said, sure. Those days there weren't any emails, you see, so we had to write. But anyway, to make a long story short, I get here, he writes the 95 medical examiners in Tennessee that they have somebody on the staff now. He should have said to identify skeletal remains, but he said dead bodies. Okay, it wasn't long after June the 1st, when I arrived, that bodies started coming in through the medical examiner's system. Those were some that you saw in the last lab that we were in. And um, to make a long story short, I was still interested in that question on how long has somebody been dead. We didn't do it in Kansas, but here was a perfect opportunity to begin that research. So 
I went to the dean in November of 71, and I said, Dean, I need some land to put dead bodies on so I can study length of time since death. And everybody said, what did he say? Well, he didn't say anything. He picked up the phone book for the university, and he found the man over on the agricultural campus who identifies, uh, who takes care of land. And I went to see him and started with a sow barn uh, in the 1960s before I came here. The university raised pigs. They were getting out of the pig raising business and they all had all these extra sow barns they weren't using. So they gave me a sow barn and that was the beginning of the body farm. Now the body farm in the four acres that I mentioned when we first started this interview did not start till 1980. The sow barn's about 15 miles off of campus. It takes 45 minutes to get out there. You do your research, 45 minutes back. You've shot a morning or an afternoon and business was picking up. I was getting lots of bodies. And um, the graduate program was going, so I had master's thesis and doctoral dissertation uh, students doing research. And I went back to the dean. I said, Dean, we need, need some land closer in. And what you refer to as the body farm started then essentially in 1980. But if you want a history, it was November of 71 when, it, when we first started. A, an, a facility, if you want to say that, an area in which we studied um, the changes that occur in bodies to determine how long they've been dead. Where did the bodies come from? Initially, the bodies came through the medical examiner system. I was on the <clears throat> medical examiner system, and in Tennessee, <clears throat> if your body ends up in the medical examiner system, this is if you... Um, you know, you're shot or something like that, and it goes to the medical examiner. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of those bodies that are never claimed. You might think every body is claimed, but it isn't. I mean, many bodies are not claimed. And so, in Tennessee, the cost of burying a John Doe or a Jane Doe uh, falls upon either the city or the county in which the death occurred. In Tennessee, it costs about $700 now to bury a John Doe or Jane Doe. And the way the economy is today, they would much rather give me the body for nothing than they would be to pay to have it buried. And so I began to get bodies that were coming through the medical examiner system. Now, as time went by and the word got out, and I had a body farm and was studying various things. Uh, people started calling and wanting to know if they could donate their body. And yeah, they, they could donate their body. Uh, and so up until 2003, the most bodies we got came through the medical examiner system. In 2003, the most bodies we got came through the donated collection, which is what we have surrounding us here. And from then on, the donated collections have steadily increased. Last year, we did 144 burials. And this is essentially one every two days. And <clears throat> the great majority of them are individuals who donated their uh, bodies for research and for the skeleton to end up in this modern skeletal collection that we have. Have you ever rejected a body? Oh yeah, we do. Um, we don't take bodies with AIDS or communicable diseases. I'm dealing with students and you don't want a student to come, you know, working in a graduate program and end up with some, you know, some disease that, so yes. How long do you keep a body in the body far before it ends up uh, here in the lab? That depends on, um, what research that body is involved in. Um, if you have a graduate student who's working on a short-term project, and it, the, re the major research going on in the body farm is either ma master's thesis or doctoral dissertations. Um, they normally do not stay out there more than a year. Now, we have two long-term faculty projects going on out there, and one of those is one by a former student of ours named Arpad Vass, 
who works over in Oak Ridge, which is the atomic energy facility not too far from Knoxville. And we have five bodies buried. We have them hooked up with pipes. And he is getting the compounds that are given off of those decaying bodies. They have been out there nine years now. So we're getting data on what's given off of bodies. We were going to do it the first couple of years, but then the question was, do you get the same compounds five years as you do the first year? Well, we don't know. Nobody, nobody knew that. So we're leaving them to see. Uh, but normally, uh, normally they would stay not more than a year. Do you have any other high-profile cases that you worked on or some of your most memorable cases that you had to well, work on? Well, okay, I have a, a couple. Richie Valley, Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, who was a disc jockey from Beaumont, Texas, and an airplane pilot died on February the 3rd of 1959 in an airplane crash outside of Clear Lake, Iowa. It's the crash that uh, the song the day the music died or the night the music died, well, that's based on that crash. Now, I did a x-ray autopsy of the body of the Big Bopper. He was the only one that exited the plane. The plane cra they took off in the middle of the night in a blinding snowstorm. Um, they should not have been flying. The pilot gets off, he gets confused and literally flew the airplane into the ground. Same thing had happened to the Kennedy boy off of Nantucket in New England, got confused and flew it into the ocean. Um, the plane skids across an Iowa farm field, stops at a fence row. The only person that exited the plane, it was a Beechcraft Bonanza, was the Big Bopper. Sitting in the left rear seat, he is catapulted through the windshield or the roof of the plane and lands on the other side of the fence. When he is found, he is outside, the other three are still in the plane. The Richardson family, his name was Giles Perry Richardson, and the Richardson family had often wondered whether their loved one survived the crash and was he going for help. And uh, they asked me if I would do an autopsy. They saw me on television, just what you're doing. So you see it's important. People watch your programs, okay. Um, they call them one though if I could do an autopsy of the Big Bopper and determine uh, if he had survived the crash and was he going for help and I said yes I think I can do that. Now the other major case I've heard I th I'm going to ask you one I know you'll say yes to um, you know who Lindbergh was Charles Lindbergh okay Lindbergh's first child was kidnapped from uh, Princeton, New Jersey, where they lived, and was killed. And Bruno Hauptmann was the man that was convicted and then executed for that death. I'm one of only two forensic anthropologists who've ever looked at the skeletal material of the big bo of uh, of the Lindbergh baby. So I guess you would say that this facility really has made quite a difference in forensic anthropology in the study of forensic anthropology. It has. This is. It was the only one that existed for years. I. Literally, I have lectured, I would say, 40 times around the country trying to convince universities that they ought to start a body farm and study length of time since death because your major factor is, uh, is climate. And not everybody dies in a climate that East Tennessee is in, you say. Uh, we need one in Arizona. We need one in, uh, San in, uh, in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Tucson, Arizona is low desert. Albuquerque, New Mexico is high desert. Um, we need one in Wisconsin. We need one in Florida. There are today probably six or eight uh, that are getting started. Um, interesting, there are three in Texas. So Texas, uh, big state, I reckon they figure. And there is, there is a lot of, of variation in the state of Texas, and climatic variation in the state of Texas, yeah. How long did you uh, run the facility? Well, I was department head for 25 years, and uh, I reckon running it. And then I still ran it after I retired. I, I worked part-time, I'd say 28, 29 years, something like that. And then I retired, retired. 
started writing books. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be my next question. What are you doing now? <laughs> writing books, getting close to the end of that too, though. Um, we had signed a contract with Harper Collins, who's our publisher, to do three more nonfiction books, and we've done two of them, um, The Bone Thief and The Bone Yard, and now we have the last one coming out in, in May of 2012. So you said you've done the forensic anthropology, you're writing books, and you're almost done with that. What, what's next for you? <laughs> Sit down and rest. <laughs>